Support for today's podcast is brought to you by FS Investments. Finding income for your clients is tough. FS Investments makes it easier by designing solutions that help investors reach their income goals and secure their futures. FS Investments never settles, so advisors and investors won't have to either. Visit fsinvestments.com slash dead celebrities and discover what it means to never settle. This is not an offer to buy securities. Investors are advised to consider investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses carefully before investing. Welcome to the Dead Celebrities Podcast. In this podcast, we break down high-profile celebrity estate planning cases for advisors and their clients. Most celebrity estate catastrophes are based on the same issues that everyday people face, just with the volume turned up. Our goal is to identify and extract the individual estate planning issues that lie at the heart of each story. We then discuss what advisors should expect and how to avoid common pitfalls. Hosted by WealthManagement.com Senior Editor David Lenick. Hello, everyone. And welcome to the latest episode of WealthManagement.com's Dead Celebrity Podcast. My name is David Lenick, and I'm a senior wealth planning editor with WealthManagement.com and Trust in Estates. For anyone new to the podcast, in each installment, myself and a guest take on a different celebrity estate and attempt to extract some key lessons that planners can apply to their more traditional clients. The idea being that celebrity estate planning catastrophes, although often ridiculous in their details, generally have at their core very basic issues that can just as easily apply to non-famous or fabulously wealthy clients. Our guest today is Sarah McDaniel. She's a CFA and Managing Director and Head of Wealth Strategies Group and Advanced Planning Centers at Morgan Stanley. Sarah has over 25 years of financial services experience working with international clientele and a demonstrated history of working with private clients, endowments, and foundations with regard to asset management, including trust, tax, and estate planning, as well as asset allocation, manager research, and portfolio construction. She's also an art history major and is an avid traveler, having visited over 65 countries to continue learning about diverse cultures and their art. Thanks for joining us, Sarah. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, Before we begin, I'm just going to drop in a quick quick disclaimer here. We're going to be talking about art planning for the most part, and uh, Morgan Stanley does not provide any investment advice or advice regarding the purchase or sale of any artwork. And this presentation is not a recommendation to buy art or add art as an asset class. So now that we have our our fun legal stuff out of the way, let's get to this week's topic. The subject of today's episode is Pablo Picasso, Uh, perhaps the most famous artist ever, certainly the most famous modern artist ever. Picasso was amazingly prolific, both in terms of his body of work and his womanizing, uh, creating an estimated 45,000 pieces of art as well as four children with three different women. Picasso also never wrote a will, supposedly due to his superstitions surrounding death. Effectively, he believed that writing a will would jinx him somehow and hasten his demise with a bad juju, so he just didn't, Um, which is obviously not a great idea. At the time of his death, his estate was valued at roughly a billion dollars, according to the New York Times. There were 1,885 paintings, 1,228 sculptures, 7,089 drawings, 30,000 prints, 150 sketchbooks, and 3,222 ceramic works, which is just a huge body of work. There were vast numbers of illustrated books, copper plates, and tapestries, and there were two chateaus and three other homes. According to one person familiar with the estate, there was also $4.5 million in loose cash and $1.3 million in gold, because why not? Uh, there were also stocks and bonds, the value of which was never made public. Uh, these elements conform, combine to form a wildly complicated and explosive estate situation that touches on nearly every aspect of estate planning, and particularly for this episode, art planning. The divisions of his holdings took six years, featuring often bitter negotiations among the seven heirs, only one of which was a child born of wedlock, which actually mattered under French law at the time. There's a lot of if you read it, there's a lot of illegitimate and legitimate with all the scare quotes involved, and that's actually legally mattered then. Um, in a quote attributed to writer Deborah Trustman, the family resembles one of Picasso's cubist constructions. Wives, mistresses, legitimate and illegitimate children, there it is, and grandchildren, all strung on an axis, like the backbone of a figure with unmatched parts. Ultimately, a settlement was reached, but it took years and years and cost some $30 million, and that's in 1973 money, so that's a lot of money. Um, The family drama was arguably the smallest problem compared to the problem posed by the French government itself. 
France at the time imposed harsh inheritance taxes of up, up nearly 90%. And with no real estate plan in place to mitigate these taxes, the Picasso estate found itself in a, a bit of a bind, uh, particularly since so much of the value was tied up in works of art, which weren't particularly liquid assets. Ultimately, the president of France, Valérie Giscard d'Estaing, which I'm sure I have just murdered that name, had to step in and agreed to accept works of art in lieu of estate tax. Um, so the French government received 203 paintings, 158 sculptures, 88 ceramics, nearly 1,500 drawings, more than 1,600 prints, and 33 sketchbooks, which they used to form the collection of the Picasso Museum in Paris. So, yeah, you heard that right. Picasso's estate was taxed so heavily that they had to create a national museum to pay it all off. And that was the compromise that they came to. That, you know, that was like the, the low ball. So on top of all that drama, there was another challenge unique to art-heavy estates that Picasso's heirs still face, and that's authentication. Uh, his heirs hold the keys to maybe the greatest art collection ever assembled, but that's a big responsibility. It's also their job to protect the legitimacy of the sales of his works, lest public trust erode and the value of, his, of their stakes plummet. But that's really, that's no easy feat, right? Picasso is still the most reproduced, widely exhibited, most faked, most stolen, and most pirated artist in the world. And the fact that he was, for instance, known to pay his bar tabs by doodling on napkins doesn't really make keeping track of the provenance of his, of his some 45,000 works of art any easier. So, Sarah, that was a lot to unpack. So let's start with just a very basic question. What are some of the most important things to be aware of when planning for a client with, with valuable art holdings? Thank you very much. Thank you again for having me. Um, I think the, the story that you just unraveled is incredibly helpful, and there are a lot of juicy details that we can discuss. I think the first thing to make the distinction between is being an artist and being an art collector, there are different rules. So if we're focusing then on the, the art collectors, um, that's fortunate because there are more things that art collectors can do during their lives for estate planning um, than an artist necessarily can do. But I want to jump back, if I may, really quickly to your point of Picasso didn't have a will. And as you said, it might have been superstition. It may have also been because at the time he was trying to divorce his first wife, he was going to have to give up half of everything that he's ever created, and he wasn't willing to do that. It's also um, potentially, as I said, in the United States, is during life, there isn't as much estate planning that an artist can do, right, um, as what they could potentially do at death. So then if we turn to then what an art collector can potentially do during life and during death, as far as their art collection, what I would say the first thing is not making a decision is making a decision. Mm -hmm. To your point is if you're not making a decision, you're effectively delegating the decision to the government and they will decide how to distribute your wealth. So it's important for someone to be very intentional about not only their financial assets, but their tan tangible assets as well, and being very deliberate in how they want to uh, distribute the, the assets. In particular with art, because it tends to be so illiquid and it tends to be an emotional and a passion asset, right? There are additional ancillary considerations that need to be taken into place. So for example, governance is utterly important. So if you are an art collector and you're alive and you potentially want to go sell um, your art collection or a part of the, uh, the art, your cost basis is actually the purchase price. It may be that you can add some of the, the cost of acquiring the art as well, but then your capital gain tax is 28% for collectibles. It's not the 20% for normal other financial assets. You might be able to mitigate some of this by setting up something called a CRT, a Charitable Remainder Unit Trust which implies then that you want it to be charitable as well. And effectively what you can do is put the art in the charitable remainder trust. You sell it in the trust. You're able to potentially get a tax deduction up front. You do not pay the capital gains tax immediately. And the remainder goes to charity. And that's how you're able to get the deduction. But in the meantime, the assets in the trust are not taxable. There is a distribution back to the family, at which time then they're paying the capital gains tax as it gets distributed out. So that's one way of mitigating potentially the cost of the higher capital gains tax if you, are, if you are an art collector. During life as well, if you want to give art to charity, right, there are some stipulations that arise in that it has to be um, a related use for the charity. So if you're trying to give something to I don't know, like a local SPCA, and they're not going to do something with the art. That's not related use, and they change the deduction amounts. 
Um, they also change the cost basis. So it's important to understand whether you're giving to a public or a private charity. It's also very important to understand whether there's related use or not because the deductions are different. I think the, you know, we're talking about charity a lot so far. And I think um, that play, there's a role of charity. It plays a larger role in maybe in the art world than in, with any other asset class, right? Um, there's a reason that so many museums, so many people are so willing to, to give their art to museums that it's just sitting in the basement or, you know, that, that the museums have an overwhelming amount that they can't even show. And that's because, you know, it's almost in a way, if, you, if you're a serious art collector and you have a large you know, multi-million dollar art collection, the charitable aspect of it almost becomes non-negotiable in a certain way, depending on you know, how quite how rich your family is. It's just so useful. There's so many different techniques and so many different ways that you can mitigate your, your, these illiquid assets and, and, and by using charity. So uh, it's not, when we're talking about charity in the art context, it's much less about sort of, uh, I mean, I'm sure that they're in the goodness of their heart and they want to share it with humanity and all that, but really it's also... It's just good planning, and, and, and it's very widespread. Well, ab- absolutely. There's been a proliferation, particularly in the past couple of decades, of private art museums. And uh, I would say that's not an accident. Um, the tax laws changed in the mid-'90s. Um, and so um, giving to public museums wasn't so much um, as advantageous as it had been prior. So then um, with the private art museums, exactly to your point is, would a collector want to give their art and have it end up in storage, or would they like to potentially set up their own private art museum, get a great architect, put it in their hometown, right? Make sure that it's governed the way they'd like to be governed, make it accessible to the public, and make it for loans as well. Um, so effectively, what they're able to do is actually um, be better stewards of their own legacy because they set up an institution in their own name with the people that they've hired. Um, specifically to maintain the collection and their legacy for the betterment of not only the, the perpetuation of their name, but also art, culture, and the locale where the institution ends up. And yeah, just uh, for anyone who's willing to look more into that, you know, the, the movie The Art of the Steel is, is a good example of sort of how even though you set up your, your private museum, um, when you're dealing with such cultural artifacts and things that are so important, so many people and the locale, as you said, of of what the museum is, there can be a lot of bleed over between uh, charitable and, and government and, and what can go on. So that's just, you know, as apropos of nothing, a very interesting documentary that sort of touches on a lot of these, uh, these issues. Great. Um, well, I think what's also interesting, too, is to the point that you said with um, the government stepping in with Picasso and the number, the enormity of the artwork to actually go to the museum to pay for the estate tax, um, not only was it bright and good because it resolved um, contentious issues, but it also was too, can you imagine if they tried to sell the art and how much art they'd have to sell to pay the estate tax, they'd effectively kill the art market for Picasso. So building on what you said earlier too, is it's not only um, with Picasso too, is the, the, the point of the copyright, right? And the legacy of Picasso and the art market itself was at stake given the situation in that by setting up the museum, they were able to do an in-kind transfer they didn't have to flood the market with a lot of Picasso art, then potentially jeopardize the price of a Picasso. But then at the same time, they set up the Picasso administration with the son, Claude, to maintain the copyright, but then the integrity of Picasso and Picasso's art market. So for any collector that has a concentration of one or two artists or have grown up with an artist and build and help um, facilitate their career, they might have a concentration, right? With financial assets, you might have a concentrated stock. With an art collector, you might have one or two concentrations of artists. And should you die, then you need the planning because you could potentially, maybe not to the extent of Picasso, flood the market. And when we are in the art world, it was something that we'd call a blockage discount. You do it with an artist's estate, but you can also do it with an art collector, too, is part of then understanding after someone passes away is what is the value of the art. And if there's a concentration and you feel that you might have to sell it, all at once, there's something called a blockage discount. So there's potentially the, the ability to get some sort of deduction as part of that. So then getting back to what I think is really important, not only is the governance, right, because it's not only the ongoing maintenance of the legacy and the integrity of the heirs and how fruitful their lives are, as you said earlier, is it's the art market, right? And particularly if there are concentrations and now there's disruption or there's uncertainty or it's unclear whether something's real and the authentication process isn't transparent, you have the potential to disrupt the art market a little bit. And some people might say, well, you know, financial markets are more important, right? Because they're larger, but the art market's a lot bigger than people think. 
And I mean, it's more because of the uniqueness of these assets. These, you know, even if you're looking at a, a print run of 200, you know, it, 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 you know, the traditional market you're used to a lot of financial advisors doing, you know, stock market, right, where it's millions of shares being sold. So to move that market, there really has to be like a lot, you know, but as the sale of a single Picasso, because there's so few, it can really have a, a very noticeable impact, much more so than, than you know, the sale of you know, a building or something could have on a real estate market, you know. These are very limited, very unique assets, and, and each one needs to be carefully sort of valued and because they do have large ripple effects on the market. Now, um, you mentioned sort of in passing the idea of a, a, of a like-kind transfer. I think this is a, a sort of very important concept, particularly for collectors of art and, and people who advise them to be aware of. So would you mind just uh, telling us a little bit about, about what that means and sort of what the use is of that kind of technique? Sure. So unfortunately, um, the in-kind transfer, the... The, the 1031 exchange that was potentially feasible in the art market, but with very strict rules, um, was taken away with the 2017 Tax Act. So that's not necessarily something that's accessible to um, an art collector right now. And that's usually um, during life when they're buying and selling and whether or not they can take the capital that was in the first work of art and put it towards another work of art. It remains for real estate, but it doesn't remain for other assets. Like so many things in our president's wonderful uh, tax plan, they remain for real estate for no longer remain for other assets. Funny how that works. So then how does one really deal? We've brought up this issue of, of illiquidity, and that seems to be sort of one of the main uh, stumbling blocks, I guess, of, of large art collections. What are some of the ways to really, you know, obviously you can't just dump the whole collection because you don't want to, you know, make, especially if you have a heavy concentration, as you mentioned, that would, you know, tilt the market in a way that's probably not good for you. Um, so how do, how, what are some ways to tackle this, this issue of illiquidity? So first thing right off the bat, I can think of two things, right? But again, you have to be very careful. If, if you're an art collector, depending on what estate planning you've done, sometimes insurance, right, to the death benefit of the insurance can buy the art from the estate and provide liquidity that way. So you don't necessarily have to think about the liquidity as much during life. Um, there's also the potential for lending and art lending. Um, the loan to values may not be as high as other financial assets, but there is potential, um, again, if there's the right provenance, if there's the right title, right, the do- right documentation is there for the art collection, there is the potential then for people to get loans against the art as well to create liquidity. But you're absolutely right, is the art market is very peculiar and nuanced, and we all know that it's still unregulated. So those people who have more information have more power in the market to understand what is and isn't um, a good price or a good value. So it's really important to work with art advisors who can help you understand where to sell the art, right? Whether it's through a dealer, whether it's through an auction house, whether it's through an art fair, right? The, the distribution channel is really important, as well as the locale internationally, because there are budding collectors all over the globe these days that who's, again, we're talking about the economics of taste, which change changes and grows over time so that evolves so having an art advisor understand help you understand not only the value of art it, it, itself but where you might sell it how you might sell it and then transaction costs are quite prohibitive right they might be upward of 20 or 30 percent right on top of the taxes that we're talking about so to your point art is very illiquid but let's also remember that it's a passion asset it's an experiential asset so while you own it you can experience it you can you know, uh, appreciate it on your wall, right? You can have stories about how you've accumulated. You can have these cool conversations about the artists. Um, so while it is dear and it is valuable, it's a passion ax- asset, but it's also subject to the economics of taste. Yeah, I like to, this idea of a passion asset is something I'd like to unpack a little more uh, because ultimately like, this is something that we see maybe more in the collectible space, um, but it equally applies to art, uh, which is really just much more valuable collectibles if you think about it um in that a lot of times with a passion asset or a collection you'll have it'll be you know, the person who's collecting it it is their whole life they know everything about it maybe they're even the foremost expert on it or amongst you know the one percent of people who, in terms of knowledge about this particular topic this particular collection of the world but just because they have that knowledge and that passion it does not necessarily mean that the rest of their family or their heirs will share that passion so there is a lot of room, first of all, when, when passing these things on, there's a lot of areas for slippage and for things to fall through the cracks, both in terms of just the very obvious 
we don't know what this is worth because we're not as familiar with it. But with art, maybe it's a little bit easier to figure out than, say, with baseball cards or something. But there's also, like, transport and storage and care. And, you know, we talked about just having it on the wall, but some things aren't meant to just have on the wall. And, you know, there's all of these aspects that really need to be addressed while the expert, being the the building person, is still around to address them and prepare. There has to be some realization that the, the future generations may not share or likely won't share the level of expertise and the level of passion for this passion asset that the initial collector did. I, I completely agree with you. If I, if I can, can begin with, uh, does the next generation want the asset? Um, so oftentimes back when I was in the art world, right, we had these incredible collectors and then we could talk about estate planning techniques, but then the immediate question was, do the heirs want the asset? And in particular, if the heirs do want the asset, which pieces do they want, right? Because fair does not e- mean equal. So you have to figure out how might you divide it amongst the heirs. But then exactly to your point is there's a lot of expertise around not only any asset, but specifically in the art world. Again, it's an unregulated market. There's, there are disparities in information and in how it's disseminated. And so, yes, if you're an heir and you really want, let's say, a Picasso, but there are two or three of them and you want one and you don't want the other two and you don't know where to sell them or how to sell them, right? Then you're faced with the, with the one that I want. How do I maintain the condition? Can I hang it on that wall? Should it be in sunlight? Is it the right climate control, right? If it's damaged, how do I potentially repair it? Does that destroy value? Does that enhance value? Who do I go to to do this? And if you want to sell it, then you are you know, challenged with, while the art world is fun and interesting, it's incredibly complex and there are a lot of nuances. And then again, that's what I'm saying is it would be great then for the maintenance of the collection and potentially the sale of the art, should that come up, to work with art advisors who are incredibly knowledgeable. Oftentimes they've grown up through the auction business. They know the collectors. They've started their own businesses and they can help you navigate the public and the private markets of the art world to understand, again, um, where there potentially is more value. And as, I mean, this is sort of a refrain on this podcast, but you know, as with anything we talk about with estate planning, it's probably always best to bring the art advisors in before the person dies. Right? I mean, coming in after is still be very helpful. Don't don't just blow that off. But as with anything, preparation is everything. And planning, it's, it's right there in the name, estate planning. And the better you plan, the more effective the plan will be. So, so it, it, it's important for advisors not just to look at, at their clients who may have just inherited art, but also look at your clients who own art and, and bring in someone to ensure that their plan is, is correct and that you know, you're not sort of uh, siphoning off value where, where you could really have easily protected it. Absolutely. What I would also suggest, too, is sometimes what um, collectors do is they'll set up a family limited partnership and they'll gift LP shares. Effectively, what they've done is they've collect, kept the collection together rather than piece by piece that might appreciate differently in value over time and favor some heirs, other, 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 others. But they can also put a governance structure in place where they have, like an art executor, they have an art advisor as part of the family limited um, structure to make sure then that the, the heirs can truly appreciate the art and not feel overburdened by the responsibility of it, what it means to take care of the art and potentially sell it in the future. And as we're talking about sort of governance and making sure the heirs want it and what they're going to do with it, it brings us back to the again another refrain of the podcast that you have to talk about this stuff um as with anything with estate planning it always seems a little ghoulish to sit there and you know while someone is, is alive and sort of just divvy up their stuff it's very uh, it's very mercenary in its way but it's also very necessary um especially with assets like this where there's so many different directions things can go um and so while it may be awkward at first as long as everyone's on the same page and you're not doing it behind people's backs, that's when it's, that's when it's weird. When it's when you're plotting, you know, when you have, you know, I keep this away from my sister. Or that, that's where things get bad. But if everyone in the family, all the potential heirs sit down and have an open conversation about these things, you can really head off a lot of problems and you can really get a lot of just planning done even without writing anything down. Just in that moment at that table, a lot of understanding and a lot of things can be head off, um, even though starting that conversation can be a little bit weird. Well, I absolutely agree. And effectively in what you just mentioned, right, is all the steps towards having a good governance structure and have the right documents. The structures, you can have a council of who are the decision makers. There might be a governing body of 
hey, these art experts saying, here's what's important, here's what's less important, here are the decisions that you need to make. You said, hey, let's have an understanding. It could be a tacit understanding, but sometimes it's more powerful to have like a mission statement of what are we trying to accomplish with this art collection, either intact or if we get uh, um, if we sell it, and potentially have bylaws of how do we make the decisions, who's making the decisions. To back up then to another part of what you said, I truly believe, right, with the art planning as well as planning overall is you need a strategy because you're trying to maintain the assets of the potential future estate and mitigate the liabilities. If you put structure in place, it mitigates the behaviors that become potentially the liabilities so the assets can actually flourish in the way that they were intended and be passed from one generation to the next intact as much as possible because you put the construct around it. And it's important here just to draw a, a distinction. We've talked about the idea of dead hand control in previous podcasts, and good governance is very different than than, than dead hand control. Good governance empowers the heirs; it, you know, it, it guides and empowers them to make their own decisions um, while still maintaining the family values. That's why we're talking about councils and and mission statements and these sorts of things. And that, that's a very separate world from you can have this if you marry a Jewish person or if you graduate from Harvard only. So when we're talking about good governance, there's, there's plenty of ways to, to, put, to exert and pass on these values and ensure that things are handled respectfully and, and well and put this good governance in place without sort of stepping on your toes of your heirs and really limiting the space they can be with, with the sort of a control that we kind of railed against in, in other podcasts. So I would say effectively, right, when we're talking about um, people inheriting and passing on art as well as other financial financial assets, to me, rightly or wrongly, it's like a capital allocation decision, right? What goes to your family? What goes to charity, if that's what you wish? And what goes to taxes? And you want to be intentional about it. You don't want to take the decision from the rules that are outlined by the government because they don't know you. They don't know your family. They don't know your values. And they don't know your intentions. Well, that's about all the time that we have for this episode. I um, really want to thank our guest, Sarah McDaniel. She's been fantastic. Hopefully we'll have you on again. Thank you for joining us, Sarah. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. And um, I guess we'll, uh, for all our listeners, I'll uh, see you guys. Or I guess you'll hear me next time. Thank you for listening to the Dead Celebrity Podcast. Click the subscribe button below to become notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of InformaWealthManagement.com. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Support for today's podcast is brought to you by FS Investments. Finding income for your clients is tough. FS Investments makes it easier by designing solutions that help investors reach their income goals and secure their futures. FS Investments never settles, so advisors and investors won't have to either. Visit fsinvestments.com slash dead celebrities and discover what it means to never settle. This is not an offer to buy securities. Investors are advised to consider investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses carefully before investing.